Hello, good evening. We're in James 4 today, the first five verses, looking at worldliness in the church. We've seen how James deals with the believer's response to trials in chapter 1. Then we saw how he defined true Christianity at the end of chapter 1, verses 19 to 27, especially in that three-point summary we've referred to over and over, James 1, 26 and 27. But James reminds us of some of the essential evidences of true Christianity, our speech, our care for those in need, and how do we keep ourselves unstained from the world and worldliness. And then he begins to work these three things out in the rest of the book. For example, in James 2, he speaks about the believer in fellowship with other believers, the sin of partiality. He speaks about how we care for one another. In James 3, he's talking about the tongue, how we use our tongue as believers. And that uh, that had been an evidence of true or fake Christianity. And then James 3, 13 to the end of the chapter, which we looked at last time, that's the passage which gives us the context. He has talked about the tongue. He has talked about our need to care for one another. And now he's starting the conversation about worldliness. And already in James 3, 13 to 18, the subject of worldliness is on his mind and it's full force on his mind now in James 4. So if you have a Bible, turn with me to James chapter 4. We'll read together the first five verses. Just remember again, this is holy ground. It is God's word. James 4 and verse 1. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says, he yearns jealousy, jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. May God bless that reading of his holy and inerrant word. You see, in James chapter 3, in 13 to 18, James has made two major points. Firstly, he has asserted that the truly good life, not the good life that people offer to you in the world, but the good life that God intends, this is the product of true and heavenly wisdom. It is heavenly wisdom. It is true wisdom that produces the good life. And then secondly, he asserted that for heavenly wisdom to grow in us as believers, it needs the environment of a fellowship that is intent on true peace. So in these statements that James is teaching us, on the one hand, if we are going to know true happiness, true blessedness, experience the true satisfaction and the fullness of life which God intended for us, then we need true wisdom, heavenly wisdom. But on the other hand, he's teaching us that you can't really grow as an individual in heavenly wisdom unless you're planted in the kind of soil that heavenly wisdom grows in. And the kind of soil that heavenly wisdom grows in is a fellowship that is committed to true wisdom, living together in peace, seeking real biblical peace. So both of those things are necessary in order to live the good life as God intended. In James 4, 1 to 5, James shows us the antithesis of a life lived in accordance with heavenly wisdom. He shows us worldliness and frighteningly he shows us worldliness in the church. In James 4, 1 to 5, he gives us the symptoms of worldliness in the church. He gives us a, di a, a diagnosis of worldliness in the church. In verses 6 to 10, we'll see that he gives us a prescription explaining the solution to the problem. But we do for now need to stop, pause, pay close attention to what he says in verses 1 to 5 and to pray about this. Because the church in every generation 
where it's not under persecution or marginalised into society, but rather living in prosperous and peaceful society and relatively prosperous itself, struggles with the sin of worldliness. The first thing to notice is selfish desire for personal pleasure and satisfaction is the source of disharmony in the body and in the individual. Just see one or two, two or three things that James teaches us here. In verse 1, James gives two diagnostic questions. And the answers to these diagnostic questions gives us the answer to the root of worldliness and broken fellowship. James asks two questions. The first is, what causes quarrels? What causes fights among you? And the second is, is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? So in asking these two rhetorical questions, James is teaching us that selfish desire for personal pleasure and satisfaction is the source of disharmony in the body and the source of disharmony in the individual. Selfish desire for satisfaction is the source of disunity and disharmony in the body as well as in the individual. See, James asks these two diagnostic questions which assume a generic struggle with harmony in the Christian church. They are a diagnostic, the diagnostic question asked to Christians to discern whether they understand their own hearts and the roots of worldliness. James assumes, even though he doesn't know intimate details about the congregations to which he is writing, he assumes that the problem of harmony is a standard problem in Christian churches. When you come into a Christian church and you see believers estranged from other believers, when you see factions that exist either in a local, local congregation or a denomination, we shouldn't be surprised. James, Paul, Peter, the Lord Jesus, the Old Testament prophets, expected, warned us that this would be a standing challenge for the believing community. But though it is a standing challenge, we should not be complacent about it because James calls that situation of disharmony, disunity, war. That's the metaphor he uses. That's how seriously he takes disharmony in the body of Christ and disharmony in the fellowship of believers. And in the second question that he asks in verse 1, he puts his finger on the problem. Where does this kind of spiritual disunity come from? James says it comes from our personal desire, our desire for personal fulfilment, personal satisfaction. It's not the source, your passions. You see, and furthermore, James sees this quest of, for satisfaction of our desires in military terms. He sees it as an invasion, not just an invasion of part of ourselves, but of all of ourselves. Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? James says this is war. When your personal desires for fulfilment and satisfaction take precedent over your love for God and your love for the brethren, in his war. And it is vital for us to understand that James isn't talking just here about some base carnal sexual desire. He's talking about the desire for personal fulfillment in any and every form. James is talking about the way that we devote time, energy, money, interest, enthusiasm in any and every way seeking self-satisfaction. James sees that as the root of disharmony in the Christian life and in Christian fellowship. My friends, we live in a world that bombards us with the opposite message of James. The world in which we live says the root of the good life, the root of happiness is seeking yourself, understanding yourself, affirming yourself, pampering yourself, actualizing yourself over and over and over and over again. The world says if you want to live the good life, look out for number one. James is saying that when the quest for personal satisfaction displaces the priority of God and his people, disharmony results in the body. Another 
area is what about disharmony in marriage? Well, disharmony can flow from a deep-seated self-centeredness in a relationship which requires self-denial. In a relationship that requires understanding another before being understood. And in the church, is your estrangement from other believers related to a deep-seated selfishness? Do you care about do you care much more about you, about your reputation, your feelings, your needs, your hurts, your wounds, than you do about brothers and sisters in Christ? These kinds of manifestations of a deep-seated selfishness are evidences of worldliness. You see, seeking satisfaction and pleasure is not just about base or carnal desire. It is about anything and everything in life. And when that quest for personal satisfaction displaces the priority of God in our lives, we are way down the road of worldliness. John Piper says Christ does not exist in order to make much of us. We exist in order to make much of him. And if we think that God and Christ exist to make much of us in order to fulfill the immediate passions, desires we have, we've fallen prey to worldliness. The worldliness about which James is speaking. Selfish desire for personal pleasure and satisfaction is the source of disharmony in the body of Christ and in the individual. So these two diagnostic questions are in designed to draw that reality out and to make us see what it is, to see our own hearts. And secondly, broken outward relationships provide the evidence of an inner heart problem. If you look at verses two and three, James goes on to say that the good life can't be had without true wisdom and true fellowship. And selfishness destroys them both. In verses two and three, he teaches us, teaches us that broken outward relationships provide the evidence of an inner problem. How do you know that you have an inner problem of worldliness, broken outward relationships? In verse two, he gives us two examples. You lust and you do not have, so you commit murder. Secondly, you're envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. Outward actions harm believers, friends in Christ. Outward disunity, they both betray inner selfishness. Covetousness and envy are at root selfish. They represent a self-focused, self-centred existence. The good life can't be had by essential selfishness. Why? Because true wisdom, James tells us in James 3, 13 to 18, heavenly wisdom, true wisdom comes from above. And what is the first principle of true wisdom? The fear of the Lord. But the first principle of selfishness is the fear of me, the awe of me, the respect of me, the concern for me. True wisdom is opposite from selfishness. True wisdom can't be had in a selfish heart and covetousness and envy and those outward actions in which they result show us an essentially selfish heart. So broken, broken outward relationships that result from this kind of worldliness show us the inner problem. But he doesn't stop for in the second half of verse two and then in verse three, he gives us two other examples. Prayerlessness and unanswered prayer. He says, look, do you pray, which suggests many are not. And the fact that you're praying, are not praying, are not praying is a fact an indication that you're not looking to God for satisfaction. Because that's not the place you're going to. No, you're devoting energy and time elsewhere. You look at how you can get it for yourself. You go to some other source and you're not looking to God in prayer for the answers to the real basic deepest, most profound and legitimate needs and satisfactions of life. We have not, because we don't ask. So James points to prayerlessness as an example and evidence of a heart problem. See, there are many to God, people who pray to God for a Rolls Royce, a Mercedes Benz and 
Lord, give me a Mercedes Benz or fill in the blank, whatever else it may be. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. In other words, you ask God, looking to him to give you the wrong kind of satisfaction. What, what are you doing? You're seeing God as a means to your ends instead of the, of the end itself. You look to God as the one to give you your passions, however warped they may be, instead of the one who is the desire of your heart. So James says our actions, our motives, tell us about our heart and our heart problems. What do your relationships say about your heart? What does your marriage say about you? What, is, what do your friendships say about you? Do you care more about God or do you care more about your own happiness? Do you care more about loyalty to God? Do you care more about pleasing him? Or do you care more about pleasing yourself? Where are the places that you're going to, to fill that void in you? Is it toys, homes, popularity, cars, power, ambition? What is it? Where are we going and what does that say about our priorities? Broken outward relationships show us wrong priorities and show us the evidence of an inner problem. My third point, friendship with the world, worldliness, means forfeiting fellowship with God, peace. You see, he said in verses four and five that friendship with the world is means forfeiting fellowship with God. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? God will brook no rival in our hearts. In verse four, James says that worldliness is spiritual adultery because you're trying to be married to Christ, but then try to be joined to another at the same time. Worldliness is spiritual adultery and the truly good life and true wisdom can't be had by those who are worldly and selfish. Verse five gives us a, gives us a summation of the teaching of scripture from the beginning to end. God, spirit, God's spirit indwells you and wants total occupation. He doesn't only want some of you, he wants all of you. And this is seen from the beginning of God's salvation, Genesis 3.15, where God pronounces his curse against Satan and then brings his judgment to Eve. He blesses her in the midst of the warning of judgment by saying, Genesis 3.15, I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, you shall bruise his heel. In other words, I'll put enmity between you and the enemy of your soul. So God has established an enmity against the world and against worldliness in his people's hearts. He wants the totality of your love and loyalty and service. And, G and James simply states categorically that friendship with the world is enmity with God. If you want to be friends with the world, you'll be an enemy of God. It's one way or the other. Who do you love? What do you love? Where is your satisfaction? What is the chief purpose of your life? And if the answer is not God through Jesus Christ, to the question of whom do you love? What do you want? What is your great satisfaction? Then your only hope is not to look within. The answers are not found within. They are found without. They're found with God in Christ. May God grant us all to look to him, to walk with him. May the Lord bless the word for his glory and for our eternal good. Amen.